This podcast is sponsored by nobody. Hey dudes, welcome to Splat from the Past, the only 80s themed horror and sci-fi show where things can get totally radical. Now, I am just so excited for today's show because I will be interviewing a member of the Songwriting Hall of Fame, a man whose songs it was a huge staple of my childhood in the 80s and 90s. I'm talking about Billy Steinberg. Yes, Billy Steinberg, one half of the songwriting duo Steinberg and Kelly with Tom Kelly. They wrote Pat Benatar's Fire and Ice, um, Cindy Lauper's True Colors, Hearts Alone, The Bangles in Your Room, and Eternal Flame, and um, the, the vinyls I Touch Myself, the Notorious uh, Classic, and of course, Madonna's Like a Virgin, the song that turned her into a megastar. And I cannot tell you just how excited I am for today's show. I mean, these guys, you know, they were the power ballad kings of the 80s. And they had these amazing women singing them, these multi-talented, amazing women singing them. And it's just going to be an honor to talk to them today. And um, I just feel humbled, you know. It's the last day of June. It's very hot over here. It's 103 degrees. You know, the sun's bubbling off everyone's faces, but I'm excited because I'm going to talk to this man. So yeah, here is my interview with Billy Steinberg. Hello. Good afternoon, Billy. Welcome to the show, sir. Thank you. Yes, how is everything over there in Los Angeles? Maybe I'll, you want to, I'm, I got you on a speakerphone, let me, I'll go on to the regular phone so that, uh, yeah, you're better sound. Okay. Things are good here, thank you. Yes, this is uh, such a great honor, thank you for taking the time today, I've got my top 40 playlist on the phone right now. <laughs> so, going back in time, um, at what age did you start gravitating towards music? When did I start gravitating towards music? Yes. Well, it really would depend on how you define the word gravitating. When I was a little child, uh, I took no music lessons whatsoever, but uh, I loved songs and records. I, I started accumulating a big record collection when I was about eight years old. Mm -hmm. And then... Uh, when the Beatles came out, I, I formed a band with some friends, and we started doing covers and playing high school dances and private parties, and that was uh, kind of what it took off from there. Nice, nice. Were, were the Beatles your main musical influence, or did you have other influences? Oh, gosh, I have so many musical influences. I'll just name a few. Okay. Uh, I, I love Roy Orbison and oh. Smokey Robinson. Yeah. Chuck Berry and, Chuck Berry and Ray Charles. Uh, those are some. I could go on and on. Wow, th those are all really good choices, really good influences. Were you uh, born in Fresno and raised in Palm Springs? Exactly. I was born in Fresno and my fa when I was eight years old, my family moved from Fresno to Palm Springs. Beautiful, beautiful. So, um, were you so were you in several bands uh, growing up, or just one? Well, the first band in, was in Palm Springs. That was called the Fables. And then uh, I was in another band in the Santa Barbara area called Dirt. Mm -hmm. We sort of focused more on, with the fables, we used to play things like the kinks and the animals and the Rolling Stones. And then when I got in the Dirt band, it was like we were, we got very interested in blues, so we were doing you know, blues material mixed with rock material. Right, because the blues rock was and very then, popular. 
Yeah. Right? I was just saying the blues, the uh, rock was very popular in the sixties and seventies. Yeah. So but then, um, mm-hmm. in uh, then in nineteen sixty eight, I started college at Bard College in upstate New York. And I was not in a band there, but I had, I took my acoustic guitar, and that's where I started writing songs in earnest. Mm-hmm. Were you, were you getting into the folk scene in New York? Well, the college was not in New York City. It was upstate. Oh, okay. So there wasn't really a scene to be part of, but... I just sat in my room and wrote songs one after the other and played them for my friends and occasionally I would give little performances around campus and I got really obsessed with songwriting there. Wow, and you had never done it before uh, college? No, high school I was just in cover bands. It was in college when I started writing songs. Nice, nice. So, uh, so after college, I mean, what, what year did uh, Billy Thermal form? Well, when I got out of college, I went back to Palm Springs, and uh, Palm Springs is in a valley called the Coachella Valley. My dad was a grape grower there, growing seedless table grapes, and I went to work for my dad. All the while I was working in the family vineyards, I kept writing songs. And then uh, new wave music came out, songs like My Sharona by the Mac, right. Just What I Needed by the Cars, um, and The Telephone by Blondie, The Talking Heads. Psycho Killer, yeah. Yeah, both that kind of music, and I I was very invigorated by it. So I started to write some rock songs, pop rock songs, you might say, with a sort of psychological bent to them. And uh, I knew I needed a, a band to record the songs. So I put together a band, and we called ourselves Billy Thermal. Mm-hmm. The name Thermal comes from the little town where uh, my dad's vineyard operation was centered, Thermal, California, which is also in the Coachella Valley. And uh, the band Billy Thermal, we started to play clubs in Los Angeles, mm-hmm. and uh, I sort of got discovered through that. Yeah, did you play all the clubs on the Sunset Strip, like the Troubadour and Leadbetters and all that? I didn't know anything about Leadbetters. We played at uh, the Troubadour. We played Madame Wong's. We played at a club called the Blah Blah Cafe. Those were some of the venues that we played at. Oh, okay, yeah, Leadbetters became the comedy store in Westwood by, by that time, probably, so... Mm-hmm. Yeah. Who who were the um, other acts that you would see on the bill? Uh, honestly, I can't really remember. I just remember my band and the fact that on one, after one performance, the famous record producer, Richard Perry, mm-hmm. came up to me after the show and signed me to a recording contract. So right. that was a thrilling experience for me. So, so yeah, I listened to the uh, Billy Thermal album. It's a wonderful lost gem of an album, I think. Um, why, why didn't it get released? Uh, well, you know, the song that everybody thought was the best single Mm-hmm was How Do I Make You? And Linda Ronstadt grabbed it and released it before we could release it. And Richard Perry didn't hear another single on the record. So he, uh, and 
sort of uh, new wave music had started to fade at that point. And so we just took our record and said goodbye, and then the band broke up. But there were, I can't remember how many songs on that record, but one was recorded by Linda Ronstadt, How Do I Make You? Mm -hmm. And then two were recorded by Pat Benatar, Right. Uh, I'm Gonna Follow You and Precious Time. So the Billy Thermal record, although it wasn't a hit by itself, it did yield some great uh, income for me from getting great covers. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, I love the album, you know. I love the, uh, the version of I'm Gonna Follow You. That's a good one. What's the the genesis behind that song? You know, I think I was trying to write something a little bit like Elvis Costello's "Watching the Detectives." Mm -hmm. I think uh, I think I'm gonna follow you was probably influenced by that song. Right. I, I hear that little you know funky reggae guitar riff that's in there. You know, um, mm -hmm. it does kind of have uh, watching the detectives um, influence to it. Yeah, I bet I mean, it's kind of hard to define the song. I mean, it does have that funky reggae riff, but it's also got the pop vocals layered in. It's a it's a unique song, I have to say. Um, and Thank you. Oh, absolutely. And speaking of Pat Benatar, she also covered Fire and Ice. I like that song. Where did that come from? Now, I didn't write that song. That song was written by Tom Kelly. Oh, okay. Before I met him. Oh, okay. And, but we met have because the Keith Olsen produced the album Crimes of Passion for Pat Benatar. I see. And my song, I'm Going to Follow You, is on that album. And Tom wrote the single Fire and Ice. And we met in 1981 at a party at Keith Olson's house. Right. And that was when I suggested to him that we try co-writing something together. I see, I see. It was one of those situations like sometimes Lennon would write a song by himself or McCartney would write a song by himself and they would get the co-credit. It was one of those things I, I see. Um, when Linda Ronstadt covered How Do I Make You and it hit the uh, pop charts, is that what gave you the incentive to, to concentrating on songwriting and performing music less? Not really. Um, I w when she recorded that song, I still was in Billy Thermal and I was still very determined to succeed as an artist. It took another year for me to kind of realize that the record industry seemed to respond more to my compositions than they did to my singing and performing. And so I decided that it wasn't so bad getting this income from these songs being recorded, and I decided to focus on that. I see, I see. So you, you meet Tom at that party, and you two hit it off. You're going to start writing songs. And uh, you two recorded that I-10 album, which I heard you say in a previous interview that uh, you didn't have a great time recording that album. But uh, you had the Toto guys backing you, and Keith Olsen produced the album. Um, I also heard you say you didn't like your version of Alone and stuff. I actually like it. I think it's it's decent. It's not the heart version, of course, but I think it's a decent version. Well, you know, Tom and I wrote the song Alone in 1982, mm -hmm. and then we did record it on that I-10 record. But it was four years later that we were approached by Ron Nevison, the record producer. Right. He was looking for a power ballad for Heart. And Tom said to me, well, why don't we submit Alone? And I said, geez, I don't know, Tom. I, I had a bad uh, feeling about that song. And he said, well, what don't you like about it? And I said, I don't like 
the first line of the chorus. Right. I think it's stiff. And if you listen to the I-10 record, you, sh you would know that it's a different lyric and a different melody than the heart version. So Tom said, well, let's just rewrite that first line of the chorus. And we did. Mm -hmm. And then we made a new demo. Heart, we didn't present the I-10 recording to Heart. We played them a brand new demo we made with the new breast lip line. Mm -hmm. And that's what they responded to. So with um, Like a Virgin, uh, you were coming out of a um, challenging relationship. Did you just come to Tom with it and he, he thought the... Um, the he came to it and he thought the song would work better as a ballad, right? Well, it was never really said that it would work better as a ballad. It's just the lyrics for Like a Virgin are sincere, although, you know, it does have that sexy kind of uh, crazy title. Right. But... Tom was looking at the verse lyrics, and when he sat down at the piano to try to write some music to the lyrics that I had, he saw the serious nature of the verse. And uh, it took a little trial and error before we arrived at the right approach to the song. So you were trying to um, make sure the song didn't come off as racy with the word virgin in it, right? No, uh, we weren't trying to make it not sound racy. I, I knew when I wrote the lyrics, which I did before Tom and I got together on the music, I knew that there would be a uh, provocative nature to the title, Like a Virgin. And I, uh, I like I like that aspect of it. I wasn't trying to make it. You know, it has a lot of different facets to it, but I certainly mm -hmm. like the provocative side of it. Oh, okay, yeah, that's just one of those things you read off the internet. That's not true. But uh, is is it true though that uh, N Nile Rodgers initially didn't want Madonna to record it? Well. Uh, I think she liked it more than he did. I heard that she said that if you don't want to record this song, then I'm going to get a different producer. She was that she was that determined that uh, "Like a Virgin" was the centerpiece for her second album. Yeah, and it also became the the title of the album, you know, which is pretty phenomenal as well. Um, was the song always meant to have that kind of um, Motown-esque hook to it? Yes, it was. If you were to hear our demo of the song, mm -hmm. the, it's a perfect blueprint for what Madonna and Nile Rodgers did with the song. They just added a live drummer where we had used a Lynn drum machine, and they added Madonna's vocal where on our demo Tom Kelly had sung it in falsetto. Wow, <laughs> that must be that must be a, a great demo. Do you still have that uh, demo tape? Of course I do. I'll share it with you sometime. Oh, that would be wonderful. That'd be really cool. What did you think of the the word "al" parody, like a surgeon? Well, I thought it was a kind of goofy, but it was all in good fun. It wasn't something of great consequence. Yeah, but you weren't offended by it. No, because we had to approve it. Yeah. You can't do a parody of a song without the, uh, the song approval of the writers, so we approved it. Yeah, I think it's pretty funny. You know, it's kind of corny now in, in hindsight, but, you know, it, I mean, it worked, and that video was hilarious, too. So, uh, True Colors, that was, a, that was a song you wrote about your mother, right? Well, I wouldn't just say single-mindedly that it was about my mother, but I would say that the original lyric, which changed over time, it had a line in it. It said, 
your friends in high places say where the pieces fit. You've got too many faces in your makeup kit, but I see your true colors shining through. And my mother did have friends in high places. She was a bit of a socialite in Palm Springs. She knew a lot of famous people. So I think she did inspire the song. Yeah, I, mean, I don't even think that term, true colors, and I could be wrong because, you know, I was super young when it came out, but I don't even think that term, true colors, was even part of the, the lexicon yet until that song. Did you, I mean, did, did you ever? I mean, did you ever hear those two words together before you came up with the song? Well, yeah, but the, the interesting thing is, it was used as a negative quality. You'd say, "Oh, I can see you can see her true colors," right. meaning it was usually something negative, and we flipped it and made it something positive, which is uh, not easy to do. Kind of, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Didn't um, Ann Murray pass on it before Cindy um, took it? I don't really remember. I know that in with all our songs, we shop the songs to various artists, and we sometimes people would pass on the songs. Mm -hmm. I remember with True Colors, we played it for Kim Carnes, and she said that. She was looking for an up-tempo song, and that she wrote her own ballads. So, uh, you know, all the all the hit songs I've ever written, pe people passed on them, and nobody really knows a hit until it's a hit. And it might seem obvious after the fact, but when someone's hearing a song for the first time, sometimes they don't know what to make of it especially a song like Like a Virgin, which was so off the wall. Right. The first people we played it for, they just thought, well, what, what is this? you got to be kidding here. Right. Have you ever written a song, though, that, that you thought was so good that you were, you were like, this can't miss, and it did? Uh, well, Tom and I wrote a song for Susanna Hoff's solo album. Oh, and yeah. it was a song called My Side of the Bed. I love that song. And I loved that song. It was the first single from Susanna's first solo album. And I really thought it was the perfect follow-up to Eternal Flame. Right. And I thought My Side of the Bed would be as big of a hit. And it wasn't. And it was very disappointing. Yeah, I think that song should have been a huge hit. It was a, a real good one, you know. And I think it also gave her a sense of, um, you know, closure of, you know, post Bengals breakup, too. That it was that it was a um, a really good positive song for her to sing. Well, I think in I wouldn't necessarily agree with you. I mean, it was a disappointment, her solo album, because oh, yeah. people felt that she would be a star as a solo artist, and it never really happened. Uh, she never, as a solo artist, she never had hits that would compare with the best Bengals hits. Right. And she does, uh, she did do, I mean, good songs in her solo work, you know, but, you know, for whatever reason, you know, I guess musical cha taste changed by that point, sadly. But yeah. uh, I, was cu I was curious, what was the inspiration behind I Drove All Night? You know, I was working, like I said, down in the Coachella Valley, mm -hmm. where my father's farm was. And I had a band and we used to play in clubs in LA and I was going back and forth a lot between the desert and the LA. And I sort of wove the story about driving all night to get to you and created a love song based on that eat nighttime commute. Right. 
yeah, I never knew if, if, if the song was, you know, about something like that or, you know, or it was just like, you know, a life on the road, you know, type of a song you know, when you're like a struggling artist or something. No, it really wasn't about being on the road. It was more about just going back and forth between the desert and Los Angeles and weaving a love interest into the song. And uh, the song was written really as a homage to the great Roy Orbison. Um, yeah. He had a song called Running Scared, yeah. and I think it... Uh, was part of the inspiration for the music for I Drove All Night. Yeah, I, I can hear a little bit of a, a Roy Orbison influence in it uh, for some reason. But yeah, Running Scared, that's a good song. Underrated one from him, too. Now, uh, going back to Susanna and the, the Bengals, how did that collaboration begin? Well, you know, I became aware of the Bengals before they had any hit records. And I liked mm -hmm. what they were doing because they were kind of a retro 60s band. Right. And I liked the idea, here's a girl group doing 60s kind of stuff. And I thought it would be a perfect vehicle for Tom Kelly and myself. And uh, so we went to a club in Hollywood, heard the Bengals perform, and we, we met Susanna Hoffs after their gig and uh, suggested to her that we co-write, and she was into it. Yeah, I talked to uh, Dan Navarro last month. He said that uh, you know, he all you knew each other from you know different circles and stuff. Him and uh, Eric Lowen had uh, worked with Michael Steele at Tower Records years before and so forth. Yeah, I mean, it seems like back then, you know, everybody knew each other, and it was such a, a smaller community back then before the Internet. Well, I didn't know those people at the Tower Records thing. I met, right. I met Dan and Eric uh, because they were also co-writing with members of the Bengals, and that's how I met those guys. And you knew that they had uh, done uh, We Belong for Pat Benatar? Yeah, beautiful song. Very beautiful. Yeah, what, one of my dad's favorites, uh, when I told him I was going to be interviewing him, he was like, oh, mention me. <laughs> so I did. Yeah, the, so the story I heard about um, Eternal Flame is that they were visiting Elvis's grave, and they saw the Eternal Flame at his grave site, and that was where the inspiration came. Uh, did she write the music, and you guys wrote the lyrics? <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> <laughs> no, nothing like that at all. That's like, uh, not even close. Um... Susanna did go with the Bengals and and they were in Memphis, Tennessee. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, I don't think it was a grave site. She went to Graceland, the mansion where Elvis used to live. Right. And there was a, a some kind of a, uh, some kind of a memorial there for him. And it was, they referred to it as the eternal flame. And so Susanna came to my house, and she mentioned having been in ne in Memphis and having been to Graceland, and she mentioned Eternal Flame. And I said, oh, that's a great title. And so I, I wrote, immediately I got out a pen and a notebook, and I wrote out the words for Eternal Flame. It just came to me in a flash. And then when we got together with Tom Kelly, he mm -hmm. came up with the melody for the song. Yeah, you know, I get embarrassed by inaccurate facts on the internet, so I truly apologize <laughs> for a couple of things I've gotten inaccurate, Billy. Um, yeah, I mean... That's okay. Uh, you know, it, we're just chatting here, but it's my job to tell the story uh, accurately. I know, it's just, I, I feel so, I feel embarrassed sometimes when I bring up inaccurate stuff. 
though. Um, did you, did you know that uh, that v Vicky Peterson reacted to the song much like John Lennon did with Yesterday? Like she thought it wasn't a right song for the Bengals. Well, uh, the Bengals, you know, they operated like a democracy. Mm -hmm. It wasn't like the Rolling Stones where everybody in the band said, Mick is the lead singer. Right. He's the front man. Or the Doors, Jim Morrison, he's the lead singer. He's the front man. Or Blondie, Debbie Harry's the lead singer. She's the front person. In the Bengals, they all considered themselves equals. And so there was a lot of competition to write, to get songs on the record, to sing lead. In my opinion, they were a great band. They would have been, they would have had more longevity if they had all acknowledged that Susanna probably had the most commercial singing voice. I so. Agree. When we turned in Eternal Flame, my understanding was that, you know, the other girls didn't like it that much. Right. Uh, they didn't think it sounded like a bangle song. And it almost got left off the album. Glad. <sighs> yeah, I mean, when I hear the song, I get the same feeling I get when I hear If She Knew What She Wants in that Susanna exudes so much empathy and she's so delicately poetic the way she sings i mean she sings as if she's narrating a fairy tale you know and i think you know the appeal of the song has 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 lasted this long because of it you know i can't imagine any of the other girls in the band singing the song so how did in your room come about well in your room was just a fun up-tempo song i think we were you know, like we were channeling the 60s when we wrote for the Bengals, and I think the song Moni Moni by uh, Tommy James and the Shondells right. may have been a little bit of a musical inspiration for In Your Room, but it was a lyric that I had written, and I I thought it was fun, you know? Mm -hmm. It's a great song. It's got the 60s sunshine pop and psychedelic garage sound. And they made a, an amazing video for it. That was kind of a homage to Laughing, and they even performed it on Saturday Night Live too. It's a, it's a cool, fun song, I think. But uh, what what's Susanna like in general to collaborate with? Well, Susanna uh, loves music. She's like uh, she never still. She's always rocking back and forth. Mm -hmm. It's always uh, kind of uh, in a groove, sort of. She's she's never still, and she's very enthusiastic. You know, uh, she appreciated the the way Tom Kelly and I wrote songs, and she was and very encouraging, and it was fun to write for her. Yeah, I mean, she's just so talented very very underrated where where did um i touch myself come from uh i was always a big fan of the divinals and mm -hmm. they weren't very well known in the united states but i knew them and i liked them and uh i got in touch with mark and chrissy the guitarist and the lead singer because I knew people at their label, Chrysalis Records in Los Angeles. They were an Australian band. And uh, I made an arrangement to uh, meet Chrissy, the lead singer, at a cafe in Hollywood. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I always, Tom and I would always start songs with lyrics that I had written. And so when I met Chrissy at the cafe in Hollywood, I had a notebook with me with ideas for songs. And I showed them to her and I said, well, which one do you like best? And she said, this one. And it was, I touched myself. And that's the one I wanted her to pick because I thought it was the coolest one. Yeah, I, I'm sure like with, with like a virgin, you, you still had that same approach of, I don't care if it's provocative, I want it to be. Yeah, 
yeah, that's exactly right. I like playing with words, and uh, I can write very sincere love songs like Eternal Flame or a song like True Colors, but then there's the other side of the coin, which are songs like I Touch Myself or Like a Virgin. Yeah, for for thirty years, people have been listening to that song and saying, "Is this song really what I th- what I think it is about?" You know, <laughs> you know, at least all the people that I know. You know, I remember when it was first used in the the first Austin Powers movie, what that with the fembot's head spinning. That was pretty funny. Gave it kind of a resurgence like six years later or something. You know, that was Susanna's idea because her husband directed the Austin Powers movie. Right. And she suggested to her husband that he use I Touch Myself in the movie, which was nice for us. Wow. <laughs> That's so cool. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. That was in the back of my mind, but I, uh, and I never really fully considered it until you just told me. So wh- what are you up to these days? Um, how's COVID been for you over there? Well, I guess it's been the same here as it has been most places. Right. Uh, You know, um, in the last uh, last 10 years, I've been writing a lot of songs with a guy called Josh Alexander. Mm -hmm. We wrote a couple of big hits together. We wrote Too Little Too Late for JoJo, and Mm -hmm. we wrote Give Your Heart a Break for uh, Demi Lovato. And so I, I keep keep writing songs. Right. And um, do, you, do you talk to Tom regularly? Tom and I stay in touch. Uh, we don't write songs together anymore, but we do stay in touch, sure. Mm-hmm. He's, he's, he's been mostly retired, right? Yeah. Yeah. You two got to be um, inducted into the Songwriters Hall of Fame in 2011. That must have been a huge thrill for you guys. Oh, yeah, definitely one of the high points of my life, you know. Yeah, was it just surreal being there, getting the award? It really was. Chrissy Hine came from London, and she inducted us into... uh, the Songwriters Hall of Fame. We had written the song I'll Stand By You with her. Right. And uh, we were big fans of The Pretenders, so it was our dream to have her there with us. And other people were inducted that same night. I think uh, Jim Steinman and Leon Russell and... Garth Brooks. I think they were all inducted in that same evening. That's good company to be in, for sure. Do you ever hear from any of the artists uh, that you wrote hits for? I stay in touch with Chrissy Hines, Susanna Hoff, and Cindy Lauper. I still talk to Mark McEntee of the Divinals. Mm-hmm. Um, I guess those are the ones I, I'm the closest in touch with. I'm sure they, they personally thank you all the time for helping their careers. Well, <laughs> that's a funny one. Um, <laughs> it's, you know, when you write a song for an artist, they make it their own. It becomes part of their lives and... Right. I wouldn't say you get a lot of gratitude. It's kind of like, uh, it's like you're running a race and you have the baton and you write the song and you pass the baton to the artist and they make it a hit and it's good for everybody. You win the race and uh, their fame is enhanced by the song and we receive royalties, but it's not a lot of, oh, thanks for writing a song for me. You don't get a lot of that. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that, too. Now with, you know, there's there's hardly any record companies and hardly any record sales and everything's being downloaded. Are the royalties still good? 
Yeah, royalties are still good when you have songs like True Colors. And some songs, like you mentioned the song In Your Room, right? Right. Well, a song like that doesn't make much money. It was a hit at the time. Right. It made some money for a couple of years and then it dropped off. The, the income dropped off. Right. So, but other songs are referred to in the music publishing world as evergreen. Fortunately for myself and for Tom Kelly, some of the songs that we wrote are in that category. Uh, yeah. And that's uh, where the income still comes from. Interesting, interesting. Well, Billy, I thank you so much for coming on today. Uh, even though we had a couple phone issues there and everything, I think um, we uh, had a pretty good chat. And I uh, hope you continue writing amazing songs and stay safe and have a great night over there. Yeah, thanks a lot. I enjoyed our conversation. My pleasure, sir. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Well, there you have it. Billy Steinberg. Ain't he a cool dude? What a nice guy, huh? And, um, yeah, he's written iconic songs from our childhood and will continue to do so. I mean, he's an amazing songwriter. That's great he doesn't give a fuck about offending people in his songs. I didn't think he did, but, you know, playing it safe. Well, until next time, this is Tommy Throwback Kovac saying, There's no shame in living in the past because the present sucks. Later, dudes. Being cool in your room. <laughs>